I'd like to welcome everyone to our um, latest event in Georgetown's ADF lecture series. And um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, the History Department in Georgetown um, and Chris Sealing for the support of this event, as well as the Asian Studies Program and the School of Foreign Service. And um, I'm so pleased to introduce Dr. Andrea Mendoza today. Um, she's Assistant Professor of Japanese and Comparative Literatures in the Department of Literature at UC San Diego where she serves as affiliate faculty in the Critical Gender Studies, Latin American Studies, and Japanese Studies programs. She received her PhD from Cornell on Asian Literature, Religion, and Culture in 2019. Um, Professor Mendoza's published and forthcoming work includes articles in Verge Studies in Global Asia, um, and edited a, a special issue of Japan Forum titled Japan on the Black Pacific, and an edited volume titled When East is North and South, Decolonizing Asian Pacific Studies. Her work addresses trans-Pacific phenomenology in the notion of blackness and reinscriptions of race. Her research has been supported by prestigious grants from the Mellon Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, and the Northeast Asia Council of Japan Studies Research Grant um, from the Association of Asian Studies. Currently, Professor Mendoza is working on her first monograph tentatively titled Trans-Pacific Non-Encounters, a project that develops a critical trans-Pacific approach to analyzing intellectual discourses on race and racism in 20th century Japan and Mexico and our impact on cultural productions. Um, I should mention that this event is being recorded and it will be placed on the Georgetown History Department's YouTube channel. And so if you'd prefer not to be in the recording, this would be a good time to turn off your video feed. And with that, I'll turn things over to Professor Mendoza. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see it? Yes, great. Okay, so let me begin by saying how very humbled I am to be in your company this afternoon. I'm thankful to the organizers of the Asia in Depth series, especially to Dr. Michelle Wang, who for reaching out with the invitation, I have really appreciated honestly your care in organizing this event and bringing us all together. Thank you to Chris Sealing for his help in making possible this virtual visit. Thank you to the members of the Department of History and the Asian Studies Program for welcoming me today. And finally, I'm also grateful to all of you in, on this Zoom. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Hi, Vic. Uh, Ani, and like friends who came out from all over the place to, to come hear me talk. Um, for making time to be present for this moment as we come together, albeit virtually in community across the unseated territories of the Kumeyaay and Akochitank peoples that we often call San Diego and Washington, DC. So I thought I could begin by thinking about what it means in 2021 to give a talk to talk about a process that we call racialization under imperial nationalism. And I will define that term in a moment for you. And to put these in conversation with the dialogues that I build through my project. In many ways, I set out to do my larger book project in a way that would take us away from centering the United States. Yet the realities of US white supremacy and racism, I realize, have been overwhelmingly present throughout its conception, especially in the last year or so. In this brief discussion, I will be sharing with you a selection of some materials that are not completely mature, I must admit, and I think still need some time for coherence and conversation. The questions for me really are, what can the Trans-Pacific Analytic do for helping us think about the effects of modern racism across histories, discourses, and media? And what are the responsibilities of the comparative method in light of the constructed disciplinary borders of area studies that often relegate the inquiries into these histories of racial and gender discourses about empire and nation in Mexico and Japan to separate spheres of study. So these are the kinds of questions that I'm begin with, beginning with. And as a sort of disclaimer, this talk does not elaborate the diasporic connections between Asia and Latin America. These connections, as scholars like Jun Yong Veronica Kim, 
Evelyn Huda Hart, Salidet Rivas, Debbie Lee De Stefano, and many others have elaborated are significant to shaping the experiences of racialization and capitalist exploitation that affect Asian diasporic communities in and beyond Latin America. But while my concerns in this talk are definitely shaped by and indebted to these conversations around racial justice that come out of trans -bisphere. I am interested in the discursive and representative dimensions of race and racism in the context of what we can call imperial nationalism during the years that preceded and included the Asia Pacific War and the legacies of these discourses in cultural production, specifically for our interest today in a film. I will frame my talk around three benchmarks. First, I will introduce the term tierras incógnitas through story. Talking about the shared chronologies of discourses on race, Japan and Mexico between the 1920s and 1940s. And finally, I will talk about the traces or what we can call inscriptions of these ideologies in a film from 1961, Animas Trujano, in which the Rashomon actor Mifune Toshiro plays kind of disturbingly an indigenous Mexican man. I also want to clarify that this approach draws a lot from conversations in black and indigenous critical studies. We have expanded the contours of inquiry into the archives of racialization. For the US intellectual and scholar of Black thought named Chandler, for example, through his critical readings of W.E.B. Du Bois's phenomenology of race, a trans-Pacific parallax is crucial to address African-American political and philosophical thought, developing a, a narrative about global political relations at which race is central. If Du Bois prompted us to understand in 1901 the 20th that the 20th century is marked by the problem of the color line, not simply in, the, in his context as a black intellectual living in the United States, but on a global scale, we are tasked to understand how this problem is inscribed into and offers lines of departure and of reading otherwise within the archives of global modernity. I began this project with tracing through archival research the story of what seemed to me at first like an unlikely encounter. I talk about this encounter a lot because it's a starting point for the project and a lot of the theoretical framing that I do. So if you've heard this before in any capacity, I hope that it doesn't sound too repetitive. So during the early stages of the project, in like dissertation frenzy, I came across an article published in a 1931 issue of the biannual journal of literature and arts, Bungei Shunju, titled Mexico no Tetsugaksha, or as I translate it, a Mexican philosopher. In the opening paragraph, the writer, a philosopher named Kuaki Genyoku, discloses that he is not a geographer, historian, or someone with much knowledge about or interest in foreign affairs. Yet, he admits, he has nevertheless taken a sudden interest in Mexico. Up until that moment, Mexico had been, Kuwaki writes, a country that he had little knowledge about outside of the, I quote, historical writings of Washington Irving and North American depictions of the Southwest. For him, Mexico was a projection of images and artifacts, objects that Kuwaki had only encountered previously in literature and museum exhibits. Throughout the article, Kuwaki recounts his impressions of meeting with a philosopher from Mexico, a man he calls Mendoza or Mendoza. And yes, I searched, no, there is no relation. This Mendoza, whose name was Adalberto Garcia de Mendoza, along with a group of his students, had been invited to Kuwaki's university, the Tokyo Imperial University, to give a lecture as part of an international symposium on phenomenology. Though Kuwaki tells us little about Mendoza and the group of students who came from Mexico to attend the symposium, he writes in detail about the unexpected content of Mendoza's presentations. In one passage, 
Kawaki expresses surprise that rather than focusing on topics about Mexico's history or traditions, the guest speaker dealt primarily with modern European thought and modeled his work after trends in contemporary German philosophy, something he had in common with Kuwaki, a neo-Kantian scholar, and his colleagues in Japan. What is specifically fascinating about the short piece, though, is that Kuwaki also vaguely references conversations that he and Mendoza had about global politics. At the end of the article, Kuwaki sums up his impressions of Mendoza as such. Mr. Mendoza's work proves to us that besides our common philosophical interests, academic, academics in Mexico and Japan deal with and discuss similar problems about the world in similar ways. The encounter between Kuwaki and Mendoza is also recorded in Adalberto Garcia de Mendoza's reflections on his tour of Japan between 1929 and 1931. A member of the influential school of thought, El Ateneo de la Juventud, or the Anatheum of Youth, the Mexican philosopher wrote at length about the importance of Japanese modern philosophy and its challenge to the Eurocentric world order, criticizing in several passages US American white supremacy and its treatment of the empire of Japan. Yet throughout, he describes his surprise over Kuwaki's impressions of Mexico. In the same text, Mendoza shares with us a letter wherein Kuwaki wrote for him in German, which Mendoza translated into Spanish. Kuwaki writes, I quote, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be able to greet a specialist in my own field who comes from a country that until just a few moments was to me a tierra incognita, but which as I have come to learn has had connections with our homeland for a long time. I am therefore especially pleased that Dr. Mendoza always treats philosophical problems from perspectives that are identical to ours. You may ask, what was Mendoza's impression of that? While it's obvious, he writes, that our land is completely ignored, even by the intellectual classes in Japan, not only is our philosophical capacity put in doubt, but even more, we had been considered a tierra incognita. Tierra incognita. Let me share with you the, typ the typical definition of the Latin phrase terra incognita, the term from which Mendoza translates the Spanish tierra incognita. Terra incognita refers to land that has never been explored or mapped, uncharted territory, by extension, ideas or concepts that have not yet been tried or explored, an unexplored country or field of knowledge. The very enunciation of the terra incognita can be understood on the one hand as an assertion of a lack of knowledge by the speaker, and on the other, as an assertion of a lack of knowledge within the imagined space of the terrain itself. A terra incognita can, on the one hand, serve as a departure from the known, explored, and recognized, but on the other, a terra incognita can offer up a space to reproduce the known, explored, and recognized. Other terms the enunciation may conjure can include the dark continent, the rest to the West. What is it that we're meant to understand and perceive when we examine Kuwaki and Mendoza's meeting? What do we see when, they see when we see them seeing each other, in other words, orienting their way of thinking about the world around a different paradigm of relationality, one that while grounded in a history of Eurocentric education, sees within it a moment of disorientation and surprise. What can we understand out of this encounter beyond a politics of recognition between men who think of themselves in relation to other men? For me, tracing this question of masculinity uh, in intellectual production about race and empire is crucial, and I would also be happy to talk about it more later in the Q&A. The excerpt of Kuwaki's letter comes from Mendoza's collection of essays on the world significance of philosophy and culture in Japan, wherein Mendoza critically argues that Japan had inherited the responsibility for progress in Asia and the non-Anglo-American European world. This work later won Mendoza an international prize for philosophy, awarded by the organization that later became the Japan Foundation. 
In this work, La Filosofía Oriental y el Puesto de la Cultura de Japón en el Mundo, the translation is on the slide, he argues that Japan's rise as a world power in the 20th century allowed Japanese philosophy a position to criticize the racist and exclusives of the League of Nations, especially after the League of Nations rejection of the racial equality proposal at the 1919 Paris Peace Conference. Mendoza writes that, while Europe and North America could invite Japan to, I quote, the concert of Western nations in the last century, they did not treat Japanese nationals as equals and were culprits of an absolute lack of comprehension, which culminated in the United States series of brutal immigration laws and attempts to restrain the progress of not only Japan as a world power, but of other non-European nations as well. So I, I tell this story not to romanticize the shared genealogies of intellectual production or so-called even anti-racist critique in Mexico and Japan. Through this encounter, I argue that we can discuss the modern histories of Mexico and Japan as compelling cases for exploring the legacies of what Naoki Sakai has termed imperial nationalism. Of course, my use of imperial nationalism addresses not the functionality of empire building, which Mexico never technically partook in long term. Imperial nationalism can be understood as a way of tracing, mapping, and figuring the modular state by engaging processes of world building and the proliferation of borders, including those that force populations within them. The term might seem like an oxymoron, which is probably why Sakai defines imperial nationalism as an emotive effective identification, whereby nationalism, in order to affirm its own validity, identifies with something that might seem antagonistic to its mission. By the 1920s, Mexico and Imperial Japan had effectively come to embrace their statuses as settler colonial states, wherein a racialized and gendered biopolitics of imperial nationalism created conditions by which colonial and indigenous populations were forcibly displaced, killed, and sexually exploited, and their land and labor were appropriated for for the modernizing states strive for prim primitive accumulation. As Tiffany Lathabo King can remind us, the recurring and violent scene of conquest and the making of race into an object of liberal humanism are not divorced from the scenes of subjection that encompass imperial nationalism's effects on Black, Indigenous, indigenous and colonized peoples. And as a side note, if we read imperial nationalism as a feature of a history of depriving humanity and of the processes encompassing racial capitalism, then it cannot be read without linking it to the production of area out of terras incognitas, or perhaps even to the Cold War history of area studies. We can trace further similarities between discourses on race, empire building, and nation in Mexico and Japan to intellectual production during the years preceding and including the Asia Pacific War. You may be familiar with a work like the 1925 cosmic race, La Raza Cosmica by Jose Vasconcelos, a mentor and colleague to Mendoza and member of the Ateneo de la Juventud, the Atheum of Youth at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. This text famously promoted an image of Latin American multiracialism, mestizaje, as the inheritor of a new world order. After Vasconcelos, Samuel Ramos, another Ateneo member, wrote the profile of man and culture in Mexico around the metaphor of this mixed racial subject, viewing him as a site for cultural revitalization and progress. In Japan, Miki Kiyoshi, who came out of the Kyoto School of Thought at Kyoto Imperial University, where Kuwaki was once employed, was eventually in the late 1930s responsible for conceptualizing the ideology behind the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. Tanabe Hajime, another Kyoto School member, through his essays in The Logic of Space or Su no Rondi, influenced ideologies around the creation of a multi-ethnic imperial nation that would subsume the ethnic and racial particularities of all ethno-national subjects into one universalized identity or empire. 
And it's worth noting that all of these texts were published around the same 10 years. So between 1925, maybe 15 years, 1925 to 1940. A dialogue between these archives is crucial for two reasons I identify. One, it destabilizes our view of the history of modern racism as a paradigm of center of periphery. And two, it also forges an encounter between two similar yet desperately evolved critiques of Eurocentrism and its role in the global imaginaries of the 20th century. The influence of men like Vasconcelos, Miki, Tanabe, and Ramos in considering national identity, regional culture, and racial thought outside of Eurocentric paradigms is undeniable. A confrontation against white supremacy can be read as a meeting point, as a type of bridge between these intellectual trends, even if the philosophers responsible for these confrontations, unlike Kuwaki and Mendoza, did not meet. And this contemporaneity may seem well, quite exciting. These are two contexts that didn't really interact to the point that some might even consider them antipodal, separate fields of study, criticizing Eurocentrism while promoting alternative approaches to universal culture. And it's like, oh my God, the very thing that bridges them is a shared production of anti-racist perhaps discourses. But I ask again, what can we understand out of this beyond a politics of recognition between upper class men who think of themselves in relation to other upper class men. I should clarify, if it's not already evident, what actually happened with many of the ideals that influenced these so-called anti-racist critiques and precisely what they influenced. To echo the work of my colleague who is here, the critical Muslim studies and indigenous studies scholar, Shaista Patel, we can emphasize a quote, holding on to the multiplicity of coloniality without letting go of conquest. In other words, I could add, we can commit to relational understandings of global modernity outside Eurocentric paradigms while still attending to the transnational conduits of racism and white supremacy. By the late 1930s and early 40s, the notion of the multi-ethnic imperial Japanese nation and ideas about Latin American culturalism were used to justify colonial, racial, sexual, and linguistic violence, dispossessing numerous populations from claims to sovereignty. Promoting cultural ideology, in other words, translated into coercive forms of assimilation and ultimately genocide. Even while the critiques I just mentioned may have in their own way decentralized white supremacy, their concerns for redefining forms of anti-colonial cultural nationalisms often have the same imperial consequences as European colonial ideologies. And so this brings us to the question about the legacies, traces, and employing Lisa Lowe's terminology here, intimacies produced by these discourses. And it is in the context of the cacophonous inscriptions of race and imperial nationalism that I will be briefly discussing the 1961 film by the director Ismael Rodriguez, Animas Trujano, El Hombre Importante. Animas Trujano, a very important man. So Animas Trujano was one of Rodriguez's last films and it's based on a novel, La Mayordomía by the writer Rogelio Barriga Rivas, which was published 10 years before the release of the film. Animas Trujano tells the story of its titular character, Animas Trujano, an indigenous Oaxaca man who wants to gain the respect and recognition of his village by becoming el mayordomo, a title given to a man chosen to lead an annual religious festival. The film gives us details of the festival in the opening montage, which emulates the style of an anthropological observational documentary. So here is a clip of the opening montage. I hope you can hear it. Up my volume. In Mexican cinema, from its beginnings to today, it isn't uncommon for indigenous characters to be played by non-indigenous actors. 
nor was it uncommon for non-Indigenous popular figures like, say, Frida Kahlo, whose parents were German and Mestizo, to appropriate Indigenous aesthetics to cultivate their image. One of the legacies of discourses on mestizaje and la raza cosmica was the appropriation of a style called indigenismo or indigenism in artistic and cultural expressions. For instance, Animas Trujano's wife is played by a white actress, Guillermina Jimenez Chaboya, who is credited by her stage name, Flor Silvestre, and there she is, or Wildflower. The familiarity of the figure of the Indio in Mexican cinema, we could say, signals imperial nationalism's persistence as a marker of how indigenousness is inscribed into narratives about the nation. Chickasaw Nation scholar Jody Bird talks about representations of Indianness as colonial practice in terms of the metaphor of cacophony as a way to highlight the dissonances produced by the erasures of the struggles against indigenous oppression and dispossession. Drawing from Bird, we can apply the metaphor of cacophony further to understand this film, in which the Japanese actor, Rashomon star Mifune Toshiro, appears in the titular role. And there he is. So let me just say that this film was very successful because of its star cast. Both Mifune and Flor Silvestre were world-renowned actors. Mifune was in fact celebrated for his acting and the film even won a nomination for both an Academy Award and a Golden Globe for Best Foreign Film in 1962. Like this wasn't received as some like independent B-movie in any sense. As Animas, Mifune portrays what could only be described as the painful stereotype of indigenousness. In fact, Mifune's Animas seems to embody a cruel caricature more so than the characters played by Mexican actors. In the film, Animas is depicted as a terrible father, a drunk, a gambler. He cheats on his wife with a prostitute who also rejects him and tries to start fights that he only loses, including when he tries to defend his daughter after she is sexually assaulted by the son of a white landowner. All the while, he covets the title of the village Mayordomo, which in a literal translation would be butler or steward. So the title that he seeks to be El Mayordomo is already interpolated along the axes of class and gender, but also becomes a racial matter as it is a title given only to the indigenous villagers instead of the land owning white Latinos. Ironically, Animas believes that acquiring the title will gain him respect and recognition for his authority within the community neither of which happens when he finally does become mayordomo, revealing him to be repeatedly impotent. And how are we meant to understand the simulation of a kind of hystericized Indianness that Mifune portrays and that circulates in Animas Trujano, which seems to mark this unruly and wayward indigeneity with layers of racialization? It is important to note that although Mifune learned and performed all his lines in Spanish, his voice was later dubbed over by a non-Indigenous Mexican actor, Narciso Busquets Zarate. What is left over is the image of a Japanese man in what can only be called brown face, playing a stereotype produced by a history of nationalist and racist representation. You can hear the dissonance of the voiceover here in the following scene. As I begin to conclude my discussion, I want to turn to the name Animas to bring it into conversation with the figure that we began with, the Tierra Incognita. The name Animas Trujano is also the name of a municipality in Oaxaca where the film takes place, earning its name from the Latin word Anima and the last name Trujano after the leader, a leader in the Mexican independence. Um, the name and word animas presents us with a lexical ontology and history. Anima is Latin for soul, an animating principle of the body, a mental impulse, a disposition, or a passion. In Jungian psychology, anima is also an expression 
of the unconscious that aligns with, quote, the feminine side of men. In Animacies, Biopolitics, Racial Mattering, and Queer Affect, Mel Wai Chun points out that what they call a lexical soup of definitions around animacy is marked by a, quote, richly effective territory of mediation between life and death, positivity and negativity, impulse and substance. It might be, they write, quote, where we could imagine the territory of animacy to reside. Animas Trujano, an imagined territory where animacy resides. Through this figure, we are forced to confront a trace of the tierras incognitas alluded to by Kuaki's cartographic imagination of Mexico and produced by the histories of racialization and dispossession that collide across a trans-Pacific mediation of race, class, coloniality, and the fantasy of the national community. Scholars of indigenous critical theory like Byrd and Kwandamuka scholar Eileen Morton Robinson teach us how to better theorize and critique the legacies of colonialisms and imperialisms within, trans within epistemic production. These critiques emphasize the inscription of racialized and marginalized existence, not as phenomena in the process of disappearance, but as marked and irrefutable presences not merely in the imaginaries of the Americas or Europe, but across a global uh, across global representations of dispossession and repossession and the repossession of the figure of indigeneity in the genealogies of modernity. And to read them as such, I think, demands for us to reshape our disciplinary worlds. I want to conclude with these final thoughts. Our disciplinary worlds can reform from displacement and disorientation. For my methodology, the Trans-Pacific Vantage Point offers a site of recovery, offering the possibility of a change in habit for critical inquiry. Without displacing our attentions, we risk the failure of recognizing the legacies of the tierras incognitas we inherit. In thinking about cacophony, displacement and disorientation, my brief account today grounds the histories and discourses of modern racism along an inquiry into how their legacies continued and continue to transform and animate the contours of imperial nationalisms. By grounding our question of racism across the effective structures of philosophical and media representations, we may refuse to ignore the tierras incognitas that pervade these productions. We may even refuse to proceed outside of them in search for new grounds on which to proceed. Thank you so much. And here's a list of my reference. So thank you. I will stop the share now so we can move on to the Q&A. Thank you, Professor Mendez, and that was really wonderful. And I think that um, anyone who would like to ask any questions about the talk should feel free to just unmute themselves or speak up or put questions in the chat. And then, you know, Professor Mendoza, I'll just let you handle the Q&A unless there are questions in the chat that you'd like me to read out for you. Okay, thank you. All right, I have my notebook and my pen ready for any questions. Dr. Lifshi, I think your hand is up. Yes, hi, thanks so much. I really enjoyed that talk. Um, so uh, right now I'm teaching a, a course on 20th century Mexican literature and, and film. Um, and I was wondering the sort of work that you do, I, I'm teaching it primarily within a, you know, Mexican borders and US borders, like that's the sort of the the lines that of uh, of contact and interchange and so forth. If you were to teach a course on Mexico, right? How would you incorporate the sort of trans-Pacific elements that you're talking about? Like it's pretty common to teach La Raza Cosmica, for example. Um, but how would you do it? Uh, 
in a way that incorporates precisely the sort of methodology that you're doing in your research. Um, that's my first question. I others, if no one else has questions, but thank you. So thank you so much for that question. I will actually be teaching a course called uh, Imaginarios Transpacificos, which is on this very topic. Um, and one thing that I am really kind of grappling with is how to ensure that I'm giving, you know, attention to this transpacific vantage point, which is how I arrived to the study of Mexican literature to begin with. I'm actually trained as a scholar of Japanese literature, primarily. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a, a weird way to go, but I begin actually with La Raza Cosmica, where there are instances where Vasconcelos and, you know, his very racist manner uh, talks about the Japanese naval army and about Asia. Um, uh, there's also poetry by the writer, um, what's his name, Alfonso Reyes. Um, there's a lot by Samuel Ramos. If we want to expand it like, as a course on Latin America, Borges, um, the Argentinian writer can be included in that. But if we want to keep it to Mexico, I also am going to show this film, Anima Strujano. Um, and a really wonderful colleague at New York University, Laura Torres Rodriguez, actually just uh, in 2019 published a book called Orientaciones Transpacificas, which focuses on exchanges and influences in art and literature and popular discourse in across uh, Mexico and Asia. Uh, and I think that's a really great example of the kind of methodology that um, you can translate into a classroom context or a syllabus as well. I hope this answers your question. Sure, thank you. But we should talk more because I'm still kind of imagining the syllabus as, as we're, we're talking now even. Sure, thank you. And, uh... Hi, Andrea, again, thank you so much Hi. for this beautiful presentation. And uh, I was not able to fully participate of the happy hour, as I like to call it, the meet and greet, which uh, Michelle put together and Chris. So I really appreciate that. Your uh, you know, presentation was fantastic. And it was it resonated so much with me today because I will, I'm teaching currently uh, a, a seminar called uh, Race and Color in Latin American Art. Uh, at Georgetown in our department. So uh, today we cover the Manila uh, galleon trade. And of course we were reading Matsuda uh, in his book, you know, Pacific uh, trade and the Pacific worlds. And there were all these questions and sometimes it's fascinating to see how the representation of the other, right? Changes throughout time. Uh, and we were talking with my students today, this idea of the, the fascination of you know the viceroyalty of New Spain in the 16th and 17th century with anything that was Japanese, Be, and then how they uh, saw anything that you know was Japanese with this awe, right? This awe of the perfect world, and then how that changes when we see Vasconcelos and we see the transformation to the other, and how the the problematic exotic becomes the other. Uh, so I really appreciated your talk and I, I will definitely would like to, uh, you know, keep talking with you about, because I think we share so many interests, uh, but it was a fabulous talk. So I wanted, I wanted to express my gratitude mostly to you. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, um, Andrea, as well, uh, Dr. Hueso. I would love to hear more about your class and your work as well, because, you know, although I, work primarily in the 20th century, I am starting to kind of start, you know, inching out of my comfort zone of the 20th and 21st century to look back further because these influences, these dis discourses on race and racism mm -hmm. definitely harken back to coloniality, especially. Um, I, and I, sh I should clarify, I'm not a doctor. I'm, I don't have a P PhD. So uh, thank you. But you know, it's something I will always like to clarify, but thank you so much. And yes, I think we will, it will be wonderful to talk with you about it. I'm currently working, I'm planning on having my first book, uh, you know, I'm working on research and I'm interested, my specialty and my interest is uh, spectacle, processions, theater and race mm -hmm. uh, from what happens, the transition between pre-conquest to today. 
And we see that definitely in processions in Mexico and in Latin America. I am from Argentina, so I, I really appreciated the inclusion of Borges in all this conversation. But I would love to keep uh, talking with you and see, you know, how we can help each other in this research and this wonderful research. I would really love to read your work. Um, and in the context of like, you know, other of these types of connections and discussions about racism and the trans-Pacific context, I would also really recommend, especially when we're talking about media studies, mm -hmm. um, the work of Jun Young Veronica Kim, um, mm -hmm. who works on the Korean diaspora in Argentina, but also more mm -hmm. broadly about these questions of like discursive analysis and media uh, studies. Um, just, and she's also a powerhouse within um, this like subfield and a huge influence to me as well. Thanks again. Shout out, you know, other women who work on this topic. Oh, there's a question by Howard Spendelow, Dr. Spendelow in the chat, I believe. Um, can you say more about either in Mexico or Japan or elsewhere? about the practice of using actors of one ethnic minority to portray another. I'm thinking of early productions of The King and I with Yul Brynner, who's Russian Buryat, and uh, in the title role and the ordinary ties played by Puerto Ricans. Well, I mean, there's a huge history of this, right? Um, of ethnic appropriation, um, whether we wanna call it blackface, yellowface and so forth that, you know, was at the very beginning of the history of cinema um, and now I think it's becoming a larger conversation. One conversation that I have with my students, even in my Japanese film class, where we watch, uh, for instance, um, the 1995 version of the Japanese anime film, Ghost in the Shell, which when it was remade in 2017 uh, for American audiences, um, had a white actress, Scarlett Johansson, in the starring role. And one of the questions that came up with, you know, is it ethical for a white actress to play a character that, although animated, uh, originally existed within a Japanophone media context? So these conversations, I think, are always ongoing. And cinema, I think, is a really active site for thinking about the ways that unethically and in for, you know, various violent political reasons, um, racial appropriation um, has been, I guess, not addressed fully enough. Um, I don't know if I fully answered your question. If you'd like to, you know, elaborate further on um, what else, or we can even have a conversation <laughs> about this too, yeah. Uh, I was uh, just thinking, and Professor Benedict may be able to, to help me on this, but I believe during the um, 2008 Olympics in, in Beijing, there was some talk about lack of ethnic diversity and part of the Chinese response was, well, we had people in their costumes up there. Does it really matter whether they were ethnic Han dressed as Tibetans or, or not? And for a lot of people, it did matter. Um, I remember actually talking about this when I was a TA at Cornell for Intro to China we talked, we watched the introductory ceremony for the Beijing, uh, the Beijing Olympics in, 20, in 2008, 2008, um, and revealed through the reading that all of the participants were actually Han Chinese. So what does it mean when a so-called ethnic majority um, feels it is appropriate to represent other cultures or other ethnicities? What are the implications of that? for the people who belong to those ethnicities themselves that seeing themselves represented in this um, collective and, er, and violent erasure. Um, you know, there's definitely more to say about too, that too. And I would love to hear your thoughts. I don't have any particular thoughts other, other than raising these issues for my students as they're looking at what's going on in China today, um, particularly the uh, switch in uh, languages that Mongolian culture are being taught in. Oh yeah, you, you have your Mongolian language uh, in um, uh, um, for your math classes, but we're gonna do your literature in Chinese. 
you know, which reminds me back in the in, uh, the old Tsarist Empire, uh, when Poland was a part of it, you, you, you read your Polish literature only in Russian translation, which I think for the Polish population was a little more than a little annoying. Yeah, I'll, and I'll leave it at that. Well, one uh, sort of response to that could be, you know, we, we think about literature and film as, you know, purely artistic representation or aesthetic productions. But we don't think about the ways, or we, we do think of here probably in this space, we do think about the ways in which literature, art, and film are technologies of subject formation and identity formation. And I think representation is a huge part of that. Um, because I mean, Miki Kiyoshi himself talked about, you know, and Foucault later also took this, on, this question on, uh, the technology of subjectivity. Uh, how reading literature transforms you into a sort of person. Because literature has been used for centuries upon centuries as a way to shape the way that people think about particular issues. And more importantly, to shape the way that they think about themselves as they participate in a larger community. So I think this is a larger question, you're right. And um, it's so appropriate to talk about it with students especially in an age where information technology and social media um, has given us these new types of technology sub, sub, uh, sub, subjectivity, wherein race and ethnicity and questions of gender identity are so prevalent. Um, I think Dr. Lifshi has a question too, so I will turn it to him. Hi again, just uh, two other just quick questions I was thinking about during your talk. One, I was wondering if, um, if the, the, on the Mexican side, the Mexican poet Jose Juan Tablada, who, who experimented a great deal with what he perceived to be at least sort of Japanese aesthetic forms and, and images, and how that would play into your overall discussion of later things like La, La Raza, Cosmica, just where that fits in into your sort of perception of, of this uh, trans-Pacific genealogy. And then my other question thinking about it was on the Japanese side, um, I kept waiting for you during your talk to point out that sort of Japanese um, ideas of race, the, the, the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere was uh, you know, a staggering disaster series of atrocities like all over the place. And uh, you know, for what everyone thinks of La Raza Cosmica, it did not result in um, you know, genocidal or, or, you know, sort of policies of state. And I know at the end of your talk, you came, you, you issued this caveat that this is how things ended up, right? With sort of Japanese sort of racial ideas. Yeah, it's, it's against white supremacy, but the upshot at the end of the day is still tens of millions of dead people everywhere. So, you know, so I was wondering why, if you could just speak about the, why you chose to put that at the end rather than foreground that seemingly very important distinction to me of, you know, La Raza Cosmic as a statement of principles and what everyone thinks of those principles, it didn't end up, you know, what happened in, in the Philippines, in Korea, in Taiwan, in China, thanks to, you know, the racial ideologies of the Japanese imperial state, you know, at some level. So I was wondering if you could just talk more about um, those tensions as you, as, as you, and you, and you, that are there. Thank you. And that's it for me. No, that's a really great question. And I appreciate that you brought it up because in the larger project, I do go into that distinction and it is absolutely important for me to make it. Um, it's also important for me to say that like people like Miki Kiyoshi and Tanabe Hajime did not, you know, set out to do philosophy for the purpose of, you know, strategizing genocide and war and colonization. Um, there are some people that will fault them for it and kind of talk about Tanabe Hajime as they do for one of the mentors of many Kyoto school and Ateneo de la Juventud members, Martin Heidegger, who was an affiliate of the Nazi party. Um, at the time in Japan, of course, it was really common for intellectuals to be targeted if they were in any way against um, the empire or, or governmental ideologies. And people like Tanabe and especially Miki um, were quite strategic in the way that they presented their work. But I, I don't want to say, hey, these guys were totally for 
the expansion of the Japanese empire and on board 100% the entire time. And we can map their philosophies onto the plans of colonization. I don't think that that's what Miki imagined when he proposed the idea of the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. I read it more as this proposal for a kind of liberal with ideas about with ideas about universal human uh, um, inheritors of the caveats of liberal humanism and modernity um, were quite colonial, were quite racist. Um, now on the side of praxis and the way that these ideologies were co-opted, yes, there is a huge difference between an all out total war in the Asia Pacific that um, was violent, that you know cost sex trafficking um, we, at the beginning of our discussion around four, we talked about the Remsayer article, and those cannot be denied. Um, yes, ideas that Bas Vasconcelos, Jose Vasconcelos created, maybe were not as violent, although that can be kind of raised as a question too, because Jose Vasconcelos was a Nazi. He wrote for, under a pseudonym for a Nazi propaganda magazine in 1940 called Timon. He became the Minister of Education and proposed a lot of policies that were very anti-Indigenous, including uh, promoting Hispanophone education. So, you know, that form of genocide, of course, is not, you know, to the scale that Japanese colonialism and uh, imperial violence were by any regards. Um, but I do think it is on a smaller scale, a type of colonial violence and um, deprivation and dispossession of sovereignty that occurred. Um, and I think we can hold those together in tension while, and recognize their, their differences while also tracing their similar trajectories. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm sorry, I have to take my, drive my son home from Taekwondo now, but I really okay. love the talk. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I, have to go. I look forward to further conversation and drive safe. Speaking Absolutely. Of Thank you. Bye. Speaking of trans-Pacific exchanges, right? Taekwondo. <laughs> okay. Audio. Okay, it's okay. I don't know how much time we have, but I um, this was a wonderful talk, so inspiring. I feel like I have so many things to read. Um, so thank you so much for that. I was just frankly flabbergasted and amazed to learn about this film and that it existed. And I was a little bit curious, you mentioned the reception sort of in Mexico and I think in the US, but was it screened in Japan? Was there any reaction there? And also just how did this come to exist? I'm so, it, still taking it in, but I'm so fascinated by this story. So this is, uh, I'm so glad that you're asking this question. Uh, this is a part of the research that I'm just starting out and because of COVID, I haven't visited the archives in Japan over two years, uh, but um, it was actually received well in Japan. It was screened in Japan. Um, I know that there exist reviews of the film in Japanese that I need to get my hands on. Um, and the way that this film came to be basically was that Ismael Rodriguez was a cinephile and a fan of Kurosawa films and a fan of Mifune Toshiro and reached out to invite him to star in this film, which Mifune was really excited to do. Um, and it was, you know, seen as a like, huge spectacle of intercultural exchange Mifune in, in Mexico. There are actually on YouTube some videos that you can watch of the, of the making of the film. The, the quality is not so great, but um, you see kind of like Mifune kind of like really like loving embodying this role and enjoying the film itself, even if he wasn't able to understand, you know, what the producers or the director were saying without a, an interpreter, he was able to learn all his lines in Spanish. Um, but again, was later dubbed over by a Mexican actor. So I guess the full answer to your question is to be, decided because I, I do need to um, visit those archival materials once um, things open up a little bit more.
Thank you for that. Are there any other questions for Professor Mendoza? It's been such a wonderful talk and a great discussion afterwards. I'm just kind of scanning, doing a quick scan of the room. Okay. Um, we still have time. I have a question, but I don't want to keep anyone. No, no, no please go ahead. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, this is so great. Thank you so much for doing this, especially the um, thinking of that kind of presence with the dubbing and the, yeah, there's a lot going on. I was curious about um, when you were talking about, you know, having what the Trans-Pacific Vantage Point gets us and sort of having changes in habit with critical work. One of the things that I keep thinking about trying to do this work and trying to decenter or think from other spaces is the role of archives. And since you just mentioned archives and started your talk with this really cool um, encounter that comes from archives. I guess I'm trying to think of, also because I've been reading Fadir Hartman as everyone is and should be, and talking about thinking of critical fabulation, also about archival absences and practices of presencing in archives as methodologies for scholars who are trying to do reparative work or ethical work or have an engagement that is um, less, less extractive. Um, than previously. I was wondering if you had thoughts about archival work or what you've been doing with this project and how that's that's panned out. Yeah, I mean, I wish I, I could be doing more archival work this with this project, but I haven't been to the archives since I graduated from Cornell, right? But for me, archival research, I think, bears a lot of responsibility because these are documents that don't just exist in the world. They have a politics, they not only the, the, the writing itself within the document, but the way that they are, um, where they exist, like what libraries hold them, um, what kind of funding goes into the archival presences um, for them to you know, even be available for public or scholarly use. So I try to think a lot through on the, in the lines of what like Lisa Lowe talks about in the introduction to the intimacies of four continents, right? Where you know, archival research, um, needs to be critical because we are responsible in the sense that we have a responsibility to respond to how the archives appear and how we receive them along not only you know what the contents are but our positionalities are as well so when i you know saw this document the the article written by kuaki genyoku where he talks about mendoza and he begins by talking about you know the way that he's received images of Mexico through these um, like exoticized images that come from the not like the writings of Washington Irving um, and like U.S. basically like North American depictions of what Mexico is, um, which, which we can imagine you know as like Western type you know aesthetics. Um, there's already there kind of like an understanding of a racialized image and I'm and I as you know a Mexican immigrant who's a mestiza and who is also a scholar of Japanese literature I always think what is my positionality's responsibility to these to these textual traces um what is it that I can read and respond to within them and what are the texts that I think I need to reach out to to be a more responsible critic um so Saidia Hartman is someone that I consult a lot for my writing. Tiffany Lefebvre King, I talk about, you know, the how indebted I am to scholars of indigenous critical theory uh, in order to be able to make these analyses. Um, so I think it's, I, I guess, like one of the things that I always do is like honor like the BIPOC women scholars, BIPOC non-binary scholars that are already doing this really critical archival work and see th the ways that I can bring it into my field and into my own project. This is kind of a long-winded way to say that I'm still figuring it out. Are there any more, sorry, um, are there any more questions for Professor Mendoza? Okay, I think if not, 
I'd like to, um, um, before we thank her for a wonderful talk, I'd like to put in a plug for our next event and to invite anyone in the audience who would like to be on the Asian Deaf Listserv um, to please go ahead and drop their email addresses in the main chat. So not on a private chat to me, but in the main chat. And we'll hang on to those and Christine will add you to the email list. And I want to thank everyone for coming today. And I would just like to let you know about our next lecture in this series. And this event will be on April 15th. And it's a talk by Eric Schlissel, who is an assistant professor in history at George Washington University, tell Confucian civilization and its discontents, the Uyghur homeland in the late Qing. And then with that, I would like to thank all of you for coming, um, to thank Professor Mendoza for her amazing talk. And if you could all join me in a round of applause and thanks for her. Okay, thank you so, so much. And hope that some, you know, some will all stay in touch either through these lectures or, or through direct email contact. So thank you so, so much everyone for coming and thank you, Professor Mendoza. Thank you all so much. It was really great to be here. And thank you, Dr. Wang, for inviting me. This was such a fun experience.